Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Washington? Things are hot and humid, but uh, the leaves are just barely starting to fall. So uh, fall is around the corner. And thanks for having me, Jimmy. I appreciate it. You're welcome. There's a lot of great sports franchises in Washington. Are you a football fan, a hockey fan, or what? I, I would say I'm a long-suffering uh, Washington Commanders fan. Uh, and I'm also a hockey fan, though, as well. My parents were born and raised in Canada. And so I think uh, even though I was born and raised here in the States, I sort of inherited some of their their genes for the ice. And so always, always loved hockey and um, continue to. Well, you have a great team. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I mean, Ovi, right? Who could who could not love that guy? Chris, before we do a deep dive on battery metals, let's start with a brief introduction to your firm, Host Mountain Partners. Where is the firm based and what is the mandate of your firm? Sure. So uh, as as was mentioned, you know, we're based down here in Washington, D.C. I spent about the first 20 years of my career actually in New York in different financial roles. And then back in about 2010, broke away from a job I had at a brokerage firm on the sell side with the intention of building my own independent battery metals research and advisory platform. Um, I've always had a passion for geopolitics and technology and just commodity supply and demand. And I remember looking around at that point in time and thinking, gosh, you know, there's no bold bracket bank that has a lithium analyst or a battery analyst. And so I thought there was an interesting opportunity. So started that in about 2010, again, really focusing more on supply chain research. And it's evolved to today where I will work with investors. I'll work with private equity groups, I'll work with academia, I'll work with a lot of corporations as well, like oil and gas and, and chemical companies, all really trying to get their heads around this kind of big, big question, right, around the energy transition, which is how do we participate and how do we position ourselves as the world moves to decarbonize? And so I'm not a geologist or a hydrometallurgist or anything like that, but I really look at this more from a macro perspective, and, and that's really what I try and provide for my client base. Chris, when we discuss battery metals, we're looking at lithium, nickel, cobalt, and manganese. And But I want to focus on the lithium, given that it's up 100% year to date, and it was up over 400% in 2021. So why don't we just start with the very basics? What are the top producing countries of lithium? Sure. So top producing uh, countries and, and companies, the countries are right now Chile and Argentina. Uh, with Argentina really growing actually quite strongly from the brine side. And on the hard rock side, most of what is produced these days comes from Western Australia. I think it's important to realize or, or, or remember that lithium in and of itself is not rare, not rare in the Earth's crust. If the price ever got high enough, and I know we'll chat about pricing here in a few minutes, um, you could extract lithium from seawater. Okay, so it is literally everywhere. So finding it is not the problem. What is the challenge that the entire supply chain is dealing with right now is finding uh, orders of magnitude more lithium uh, and producing battery quality uh, um, battery quality uh, amounts, for lack of a better phrase. So finding it's not the problem, but then taking it and refining it and purifying it and utilizing it in the battery business is what the what the real challenge is right now. So again, just to reiterate. The brine source, which is about maybe 60, 65 percent of global lithium production today, comes from uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile and, of course, comes from Argentina, as I mentioned before. The majority of hard rock, uh, which is a real powerhouse and really growing strongly, comes from Western Australia. And who would be the top producers of lithium or the top miners? Sure. So, uh, you know, lithium used to be an oligopoly, just controlled by three or four major players. And that, again, is is slowly starting to change. Some of the major players today are, of course, Albemarle, Livent, SQM, again, down in Chile, Livent's over in, in Argentina, uh, Ganfeng Lithium and Tianxi are two major Chinese producers. Those are who I would probably call the big five. And then you've got some other companies that are perhaps smaller producers, but growing like Alchem or Pilbara Minerals or mineral resources as well. And so those are just basically a handful of the core of the major lithium producers today. And again, that kind of table, if you will, of uh, producers is set to grow in the coming years as well, even though these companies that I just mentioned will be expanding capacity. 
Let's examine the size of the lithium market. When I hear of a commodity being up 100 plus percent on the year, right away I think it's it's a very small market and it's very illiquid. Is this true of the lithium market? Generally speaking, yes. And this is the illiquidity, the small sort of size of the market. The lithium market today, and we measure it in terms of what we call lithium carbonate equivalent units or LCEs. It's around 550,000 tons per year. Um, and again, that's spread across not just the battery business, but ceramics and greases and glass and things like that as well. Um, look, lithium is a small market today. Uh, even if it does grow at a forecast 20% growth rate, which I think it will out to 2030, that puts the lithium market at around two and a half to three million tons in size, which is what the nickel market is today. So, you know, everything I would argue from a battery metals perspective is going to grow at different rates out to 2030, but lithium really is, is the shining star for lack of a better phrase. And I think one of the reasons for that is that again when you just think about the growth in the lithium ion battery you can play around with the amount of nickel play around with the amount of cobalt etc cetera, etc cetera. you really cannot minimize or use less lithium in the lithium ion battery so it's going to remain pretty constant and that's why it's really going to grow strongly over the course of this decade and maybe you can give us a sense of where the lithium price is and where it's come from in the last few years sure so if we were having this conversation literally two years ago, almost to the day, uh, li the lithium price, and again, we talked earlier about how the fact that it's an opaque market, lithium is almost exclusively uh, a contract market between buyers and sellers. I would estimate that probably 80 to maybe 90% of that 550,000 tons is under contract or historically has, has operated that way. So you've got a very small spot market for lithium, which exists exclusively in China. And then the remainder is, is rest of the world between some of those producers that I mentioned and the end users like battery manufacturers or OEMs. So Jimmy, to answer your question specifically, two years ago, the spot price for battery grade lithium carbonate was around 6,500, maybe 7,000 US dollars a ton. Today, that same product in China in the spot market is around $70,000 a ton, okay? And there's a number of reasons for that. Obviously, robust demand. There is some speculation and some hoarding, I would argue, going on, but the majority of that $70,000 price really is underpinned by very, very strong demand in China. So you got a $70,000 price inside China. Outside China, with respect to the contracts that are being struck between producer and consumer, you know, the prices are a little bit lower, $30,000 a ton, $40,000 a ton. But again, you know, go back to that $6,500 or $7,000 a ton number for carbonate that I mentioned. I mean, even on a contract basis, and these contracts can go anywhere from one to three to five years. And, you know, you could have fixed pricing. But what we're also seeing is that uh, producer and consumer have really agreed to benchmark pricing. So it will float. But the bottom line is that pricing for everything, whether or not you're locking in a long-term deal or just buying it today, pricing is way, way up. That's a great overview of the lithium market and pricing. I want to move on now and look at lithium in the EV uh, market and also how OEMs are responding to this. The primary element which is really driving the growth in lithium-ion batteries is this push toward decarbonization and also the use of EVs. EV production has grown from 55,000 units in 2011 to 6.6 .6 million in 2021, and some firms are projecting uh, up to 10 million uh, EVs being sold in 2022. How important is the lithium to the overall cost of the battery? And given lithium is at or near all-time highs, do OEMs care about the price of lithium? Yeah, I think lithium. the lithium price is... Um, minimal a minimal concern to the oems of course they may argue with that i think the bigger issue is if you're a supply chain manager for an automotive manufacturer uh, lithium is one of a number of of issues or raw materials that you have to concern yourself with i mean obviously if you're producing uh, nickel manganese cobalt batteries or you're utilizing that technology in your ev Lithium is not the only issue. You have to think about nickel sourcing. You have to think about cobalt. You have to think about manganese. And of course, there's this um, 
additional what I would call an ESG overhang or ESG issue uh, with respect to you know sourcing it is is one obviously very important issue, but doing so and finding the source of these materials that is produced in a sustainable and environmentally friendly way is becoming a much, much bigger challenge. And so, you know, that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question was, what is what is the cost of lithium in the battery? And even today at existing lithium prices that are elevated, it's probably maybe 15% of the cost of the overall EV. And that's up from say, I don't know, five, 6% historically. So. You know, this isn't a total deal breaker, but again, at the end of the day, what these OEMs are really the most concerned with is just finding the actual battery grade lithium units. And so they're willing to pay that premium for it just to get their hands on it. So if I'm spending $100,000 on a Tesla, approximately 15% of that cost or $15,000 is associated with the lithium ion battery. Approximately, you know, those are those sort of back of the envelope numbers. I mean, a lot of people look at, they say, well, what is the cost of the entire battery? And of course, that's around a third of the cost of the car. And there's a lot that goes into that, the raw material components. I mean, the cathode can be upwards of 50% of the cost of the battery. So as I mentioned before, when you combine lithium with nickel and cobalt and some of these other metals, that's where it really starts to get concerning. And, you know, one of the, one of the, I guess, beautiful aspects of the lithium ion supply chain is the fact that really since 1990, when lithium ion batteries were first commercialized, uh, the price of a lithium ion battery in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour has continued to fall year over year over year, anywhere from, I don't know, five to eight, maybe 10% uh, per year. And because of what we have seen now with these pricing dynamics, um, pricing has plateaued. I should say battery pricing has plateaued. And that, of course, has implications for that kind of moment in time when an unsubsidized electric vehicle will be cheaper to own over the course of its life relative to a similar internal combustion engine vehicle. So, you know, um, it was perhaps 2025 when things were going to tip in our in our favor. If you're a bull on the EV uh, space, now it's maybe 2027. So it's a little bit more down the road, but uh, it's still coming no matter what. A number of countries, including the UK, Germany, and Belgium, have said they want to ban the sale of new gas cars by 2030. California recently said they want to ban the sale of new gas cars by 2035. Ford, GM, Volkswagen, and many other OEMs have made significant investments in EVs and they're expanding out their, their fleet of EVs. You mentioned we're already or we're close to a deficit, will there be enough lithium production in the future to meet these goals? Are these goals set out by the UK, Germany, and Belgium, for example? Are they attainable? Uh, you know, look, the short answer is no, okay? I mean, it's wonderful to, I think, put a deadline on, on this conversion and sort of the ban of internal combustion engines, whether or not it's 2030 or 2035. But, um, you know, that 20, coming back to that 20% growth rate for lithium that I mentioned before, um, you know, that requires around 130 or $140,000, or excuse me, 140,000 tons of lithium every single year between now and 2030, just to match that 20% demand rate. And the lithium business has never really had to uh, face any kind of an issue in that respect. And so, you know, the short answer, Jimmy, I think is that maybe by 2035, you know, it will be a much bigger, much different market. But as we sit here today, without a lot more upstream investment, uh, there's no way we're going to be able to reach some of those goals. Chris, I want to move on now and spend some time on the spot market and also the contracting price. My sense is the lithium market is very much like the uranium market. It lacks transparency and it's also very illiquid. Is this true of the spot lithium market? Uh, yes, yes, I would say it's true of the lithium market overall. That said, uh, there is a move by companies such as the London Metal Exchange or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to actually build out futures contracts for lithium uh, to try and basically provide a fair amount or more, just say more pricing transparency. And so it's early days. Um, those contracts, I think it's fair to say, aren't as, as widely used or as, as liquid as I think we would like them to be. But again, as the market grows, whether or not they're used for speculation or for, for hedging against lithium pricing volatility, I think it's a good thing. 
One of the other things, uh, developments from a pricing perspective that's happened in the in uh, recent years is also on the spodumene side. And for those of you guys watching who don't know what spodumene is, it is the mineral, the hard rock mineral that hosts lithium. And you basically take a certain amount of spodumene and then convert that into battery grade lithium carbonate or battery grade lithium hydroxide. One of the major producers I talked about earlier, Pilbara Minerals, has started this electronic auction system where they auction off, I guess, excess spodumene that they produce. And so what that has done is given the market kind of an instant or a monthly actually view, I think it happens every month, of what the what the demand is and also what you know end users are willing to pay for high quality spodumene. So, you know, those developments, whether or not it's futures contracts or electronic auctions are recent, you know, within the last couple of years at least. And so you need to see more of that. And I think as, as the lithium market grows and gets bigger and, and deeper, you know, those types of tools will become much more popular. And I think they'll attract a lot more investment actually into all aspects of the lithium ion supply chain. I think that one of the reasons why Historically, investors have been a little skeptical to your point of, you know, a commodity rising by 100 percent and it's a small market. Investors are skeptical when they see that because, you know, there's not the, the history of commodities rising like that and then crashing is unfortunately quite extensive. Um, and so the more the more, I guess, liquidity and the more visibility you have in terms of lithium, the better. And so I would anticipate that really helping this market. And like I said before, bringing more um large scale investment into the business which is exactly what we need right now and if you're an end user of lithium let's just say tesla for example are you securing your the lithium in the spot market or are you actually going directly to the 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 miners or the producers like sqm and livevent for the most part, I would say almost exclusively, if you're a major automotive manufacturer, you're entering into long-term offtake agreements uh, as opposed to going to the spot market. Again, the spot market's quite small relative to the overall market. And so what, what I have seen is, is, again, the transactions in the spot market that take place, they take place in China between Chinese processors of lithium and end users. And it's because there's such a huge demand for lithium iron phosphate or LFP batteries in China specifically. Uh, but again, if you're Tesla, if you're Ford or General Motors or what have you, um, you're going out there for three to five year long-term deals. And the interesting thing that we've seen just in the current cycle is these companies, a few of which you've mentioned, a few of which I have mentioned, are actually entering into offtake agreements with lithium companies that aren't in production. Some of them don't necessarily even have shovels in the ground. Maybe they're at pilot stage. But the, again, the way I look at that is, again, it's very, very positive for lithium demand and positive for EV uptake overall, because you have these major automotive manufacturers, quite frankly, some of whom should have been making these investments five years ago are now having to, to race to catch up. And they're having to do deals with companies that quite frankly don't have any lithium production history yet so that's one instance where actually where tesla is pretty far ahead of some of these other players because they are doing deals with existing producers i'll just give one other example around the tightness of the market and and what contracts look like uh general motors has entered into a kind of a unique agreement with livent where General Motors is going to pay Livent, I think it's $198 million upfront in form of a prepayment to get access to lithium that Livent intends to produce in 2025. Again, so you have a major player out there saying, here's a huge check, giving it over to the mining company so they can then expand their, their capacity uh, with no promise of delivery of that material for another three, three and a half years. So again, it's just another really, I think, vivid example of how tight this market is and how desperate OEMs are for lithium units in particular. So if the spot market, if lithium's trading around $70,000 a ton in the spot, what price would OEMs be entering into with these long-term contracts? Closer to 30 or $40,000 a ton. I mean, you know, the pricing between buyer and seller um, can vary and it's obviously, you know, it's proprietary and confidential. It depends on the length of the contract, it depends on the tonnage involved, it depends on the product and the product quality, but 
yeah, they, you know, you can look at earnings calls, you can look at quarterly reports from some of these Australian players and just get a sense for what their sort of average price is or average selling price. And they're in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range, and these guys are all selling to the OEMs. And so I would argue that, you know, you can comfortably look at those uh, pieces of data to get a sense for for where, for what a Ford, a General Motors, a Tesla is is paying right now. Given the move in lithium and also lithium producers, SQM is up over 100% on the year, Livevent is up over 30% on the year. Are you getting a lot of calls from institutional investors? And if so, what's the nature of those investors? Are they pension <laughs> funds, mutual funds, hedge funds? Yeah, it's, you know, it's been an interesting, uh, and I would argue a very encouraging shift from what I have seen. Uh, again, if we were having this call a couple of years ago, or even during the last lithium boom and bust, which was kind of 2016 to 2018. I Back then, I had every hedge fund in Greenwich, Connecticut calling me saying, you know, what's the difference between spodumene and hydroxide or carbonate? You know, basic kind of, okay, how do I get involved in, in these names? Um, and that has changed. That has changed dramatically. What is happening now, and this has really been uh, my experience for the last couple of years, sort of from the depths of COVID to today, is that you know, the phone calls that are, are coming inward uh, to me, um, they're not hedge funds, okay? It's not fast money. I still do calls with, with investment managers, but they're more interested in nickel. They're more interested in rare earths. They're more interested in battery chemistries. Anode technology is another really hot, hot market right now for, for whatever reason. Um, you know, but my phone is ringing with respect to lithium from private equity. Uh, from oil and gas, from chemicals companies. And again, I mentioned, sort of alluded to the fact that I'm encouraged. And I'm encouraged because those companies have two things that the hedge funds don't. They can write larger checks, number one, okay, project level checks. And they are committed for a number of years, okay. Uh, they are interested in investing in businesses as opposed to just investing in stocks. And I don't mean to demean hedge funds or anything like that. I mean, they obviously play a central role in this whole thesis, but it's just a different sort of time frame. And so, again, you know, what I think the lithium ion supply chain really needs to grow is larger players with larger checkbooks and seven plus, you know, seven to 10 year horizons. And so that is the type of, of player that I'm dealing with right now. Some of it is is upstream lithium kind of curiosity. Some of it is lithium conversion capacity. Um, a lot of it has to do with lithium ion battery recycling and how that market functions and, and how we build that infrastructure here in the West. So uh, it's really, really encouraging, I would say. Very interesting. And you mentioned energy companies. By that, do you mean conventional oil and gas companies? Yes. Yep. Oil and gas, not really any utilities, although I know they're thinking about grid scale energy storage, but just in terms of who I'm sort of thinking thinking alongside and working with, it's, it's oil and gas and, and some chemicals companies as well on the corporate side. And in spite of the move that we've seen in the lithium price and also in lithium producers, is your sense that investors are still not involved in this trade? You know, Lithium is around, gosh, is it a $5 billion a year business? Uh, maybe maybe a little bit more than that. I mean, oil and gas is $2 trillion when you look at revenues, right? So lithium, given its, I always like to say that I feel like lithium punches above its weight class because it is vital for this transition. Um, it is still um, underfollowed and not particularly well understood in my view, again, just based on the inbound sort of questions that I'm getting. Um, and look, there's still a seat at the table, right? Whether or not you're an investor, you're a hedge fund, you're an individual investor, or again, some of the larger players that I talked about. I just think that oil and gas is going to remain important for decades. I'm not here to tell you that we're going 100%, you know, renewable anytime soon. Um, but there's still a lot, a lot of growth in the lithium ion supply chain uh, out over the next, I would say, 15 years. I really think we're at the, at the beginning maybe the end of the beginning, to, to quote Winston Churchill. Chris, as we wrap up, should investors be aware of any significant events in the coming months which might have an impact on the lithium price one way or the other? You know, I think that if you were to go back even a year, a year and a half ago and, and 
tell me or tell anybody in the lithium space that we'd be sitting here with $70,000 spot lithium, they would have thought you were crazy. Um, which is my way of sort of saying, gosh, I'm not, I feel like a lot of the catalysts, which are higher pricing have already been, been, um, I guess, uncovered, right. Or priced into the, the whole theme and the thesis. And so, you know, the real challenge right now on the upside, I would argue, is with near-term producers that are not yet in production right now, but are scheduled to come on, say, in the next uh, 6 to 12 to 18 months. But, you know, again, I, I don't think we're ever going back to that that era I talked about earlier of, say, $6,500 lithium. Um, the cost curve is going to continue to shift. It's going to continue to shift up. And what that means is that we're going to need more brine, more hard rock, more alternative sources as well. So um, stay the course would be my, my current view, I would think. Well, that was a very insightful discussion on lithium, and I want to thank you for making time for us today. If any of our viewers would like more information, check out the website House Mountain Partners at discoveryinvesting.com. Once again, Chris, thank you very much. Thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate it.